I don't know what you want. If you are looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. I saw that there were some posts she was indicating she was in uh, Belgium, then suddenly she was in the Netherlands, but the pictures didn't add up with the city she was in. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. And just run a PHP script through every single email, sending them, say, there's a bomb at the school, it's going to go off at 3.30 today. And that caused mass school evacuations in the UK. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't... This is a case of, uh, of probably safety, of public safety. Uh, we don't know where this person is. I will look for you. I will find you. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with a very special group of guests or a panel of guests. We're going to be talking about OSINT. Welcome. Technozet, let's start with you. Well, I'm Technozet. You can find me on Twitter at, at Technozet or I'm Technozet.com. Um, my real name is Lizette. I'm currently working in law enforcement in the Netherlands. Before this uh, call started, I was trying to like get some information out of you, but um, obviously you're very shy about sharing that, but that's fine. <laughs> Stephen? Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Stephen Harris. I, though I'm probably better known by my nickname, which is Nick Sintel, which is where you can find me on Twitter and my blog at nicksintel.info. Similar to Lisette, I have a background in law enforcement. I spent m most of my career working in cybercrime and, and uh, open source intelligence. I teach the open source intelligence course for SANS. I'm one of the instructor candidates for that. And um, I work for a company called Complex, and we use open source intelligence to help people improve their cybersecurity. And last but not least, Micah. Hey, David. It's nice to be on the show with you. Um, I'm Micah Hoffman. I go by the Web Reacher moniker online. I like to say about myself that I am a collector of amazing people in the world of OSINT, uh, bringing them together, whether it's through OSINT Curious Project whether it's through my OSINT training, this training platform I run, or whether it's through the OSINT Games Capture the Flag OSINT platform. I like bringing together the best of the best and having a lot of fun with them. My background is in psychology, then in medicine, then in uh, IT, then in cyber, and finally into OSINT. So I've got a pretty diverse background. I'm on, I'm on my like fifth career. Tell us about OSINT Curious. You know, what, what is this? Um, you know, how did the three of you get together? What, 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 what is it about? Sure. OSINT Curious is a, a U.S.-based nonprofit. It was created back in 2018 when myself and five other people got together and decided to create a free place with highly accurate and trustworthy open source intelligence training materials and blog posts. We noticed that there was a, a wide variety in the, in the technical technically complete OSINT data that was being released on the internet. And we wanted a single place where people could come to and they could trust the content. I, I go there, I know that it's going to be actionable information that's solid, ad-free, et cetera. And so back in 2018, we created the OSINT Curious Project. Right now we have about 13 members all around the world that create blog posts, YouTube videos, live streams, and 10 minute tip videos. We also have our own discord so that people can, again, come together and uh, talk as a community. I'll put the links below. Uh, please go and subscribe to the OSINT Curious uh, YouTube channel. Show them some love, you know, for sharing such great content. Uh, go and follow everyone on their social media. Uh, show them that, you know, we, we really want to get them back for, for more content. Let's start with this question. What, what is OSINT actually? Um, you know, and how do I get started? Let's start from the very beginning and say that what OSINT stands for, which is open source intelligence. Uh, and it's it's really, really broad and it can mean different things in different disciplines. Um, but it's essentially taking information that is publicly available, um, whether you pay for it or you don't pay for it, and analyzing, verifying, developing that public information into something that is useful for you, for your client, for your company. Or whatever. That, that's the intelligence part of it. So the open source is where we get the data from, and the intelligence is the useful stuff we can do with that information. In. Lizette, gear in law enforcement is this something that you know? I'm assuming gets used a lot in law, law enforcement as well as in commercial enterprises. Yeah, definitely. We do a lot of OSINT stuff within law enforcement as well. A lot of the OSINT stuff you can do, you can do like 
any other person on this planet with an internet connection and a device, either a phone, a tablet, or a laptop, would be able to do all of the things we are doing as well. The only difference for me personally for being in law enforcement is that, that I have a lot more rules to obey to, to make sure I'm not crossing any privacy lines or any laws. Uh, it's quite strict for me. And I mean, especially because you're in the EU, I suppose there's a lot of like additional rules. And we won't get into the politics, but like EU has like all kinds of rules of things that you can and can't do, right? The EU does have a lot of rules going, but uh, for in the Netherlands, it's only the, uh, the Dutch law I have to keep myself to. I'm obeying that rule and that law and making sure that everything I do um, is legal for me. Yeah. <laughs> Why OSINT? And how is that different if you like to like red teaming and or cyber, just for people who don't understand, you know, how it's different. So why do we do OSINT? Open source intelligence, or as you probably call it in cyber, reconnaissance or recon, is literally the first step in most of the cybersecurity things that people do, whether you're doing red teaming and penetration testing and you have to find targets, you have to find a person or a company, find out more about them, find out what domains they own, what IP addresses, or whether you're a blue teamer researching who's uh, attacking your systems, researching why people got a certain phishing email. And digital forensics, people use open source intelligence when they dump somebody's phone and they have all the usernames that they need to figure out what they're connected to on the on social media. So open source intelligence for me was that aha moment when I knew that my cyber career was finally coming to an end and I had found this exciting, accessible place like Technozet said, where where you can find almost anything online that people, governments, and companies are sharing. And, and it's in those techniques that we share, in those tools that we use, and ultimately, like Stephen said, in the intelligence that we develop that, that truly makes OSINT uh, an amazing all-around activity for professionals and for hobbyists alike. I once heard a story, and I don't know how true it is, that uh, some government agencies are really happy that Facebook exists because it saves them a lot of the old hard work. Um, is there some truth in that? Yeah, I, th I think so. I started my law enforcement career just before Facebook sort of came into existence. And you have to do intelligence the old fashioned way, like you had to go and speak to people and write things down and then draw maps with pen and paper to see who's connected to who. And then as Facebook became more popular, like it was all there for you. You knew yeah. who was friends with who and you knew where they went. And so, yeah, that those sort of platforms, Facebook in particular, but social media more generally has, has made things a lot easier. Do you need any special skills to do this? Or, you know, do you have to go on special courses or is it just something that you can pick up? I think anybody can do this, David. It, you just need some personal characteristics or personality traits that you can bring forth. And and really some of it, um, and uh, Technozet, I know that you want to say some of this. I'll just mention one and maybe you can take it from there. The determination that people have, the persistence, those are incredibly important when you have this, well, infinite amount of data on the internet. Technozet, what were you thinking? You have to be curious as well. You have to like want to go on this treasure hunt, as you may want to call it, to find that little gem that connects all of the dots or answers that one specific question you really need to get an answer to. And this is one big puzzle hunt. Like I'm gathering all of my pieces of information, putting them together to paint the whole picture for myself. And every time it's a different puzzle. So I rarely get bored doing this. But I think it's a, to take that metaphor like one more step, it's a puzzle that you don't know what it's a picture of until you've got all of those data points together, assemble them or analyze them, and now you can see the picture. Would that be accurate? Yeah. I agree. I, yeah, I think that's right. You don't need a sort of any formal skills or training to get started necessarily. I think to get to that end stage where you are producing really good, high quality intelligence, it, around the analysis of things that's the that's a tricky harder part and that um there's no kind of magic book you can read to do that but that's what takes the time and the practice to become a good osin practitioner i think would you, would you guys agree with that absolutely and i totally. think it, the 
the trainings give you that jump start if you need them, but very much like the cyber stuff that's out there right now, you could literally watch, I don't know, David's channel over the past couple of years, and you could learn a huge amount about hacking and all. There are so many videos out there that are uh, from various OSINT conferences. You absolutely could learn things just by watching YouTube videos and reading blog posts. Um, and especially and think, read what the community is, the OSINT community is sharing. Because I've been in this specific field in law enforcement for over nine years. But I know now that I have been doing this work for far longer than the nine yeah. years been also doing this at my previous employer. In that whole time, let's say 15 years, I only get ha have three trainings on how to do OSINT. All of the other stuff, I learned by either doing them, but also reading what other people have experienced. Like Nick's Intel writing a blog on how he geolocated a specific image on Instagram motivates me to be more specific when I'm, for example, looking at a picture, to look at the lamppost or look at a uh, electrical socket, or you, you need to be active in the community or, well, you don't need to be active, but you need to read and catch up. And if you do that, you can get like at a good certain level quite easy. Like if I was starting today, where would I start? Would I go to Ocean Curious's um, YouTube channel or what I do, first step, second step, have you got like any tips? Go here, start here, kind of like guide me. The OSINT community is very active on Twitter. Search for the hashtag OSINT. Look at all of the top tweets or all of the latest tweets. And I can guarantee you, you'll be ending up with very interesting blogs, good quality YouTube videos. And what I personally think is great about OSINT, you can read a blog, which make take you like 10 to 15 minutes and you've learned something new. Yeah. And that's what we do at Ocean Curious as well. We try to create content that doesn't take you like four hours to get to know a specific topic or a specific technique. We tend to keep it small and simple. So we do videos of 10 minutes max to teach you a new skill. And I think that's also quite cool doing OSINT is that you can learn something new in a relative short amount of time. Be curious, click around. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some names, like the three of you, that would be my first three people to follow on Twitter. Any other recommendations of accounts or people and then websites, give us give us specific websites. I'll put them below. Um, like give us your websites, um, various resources that I can start with. So my suggestion, David, is start with OSINT Curious. That's okay. OSINTCurio.us. That is like a one-stop shop to all of us on our about, about Us page. We have all of our Twitter handles. So if you don't know who to follow on Twitter, You've got that on our About Us page. But wait, there's more. If you want to talk with other people outside of just Technozette, Steve and myself, we've got a Discord where you can talk to hundreds or thousands of people all around the world that love open source intelligence. So instead of asking me, Michael Hoffman, hey, how do I do this on Facebook, Instagram uh, with a domain? You can ask people in different parts of the world, what do they do? And then also on the OSIN Curious Projects website, there are links to those 10 minute tip videos, our YouTube uh, channel, and of course our blog posts. Why did you create this? Was it just to try and help the community? Uh, we created it uh, to, to have that voice and to bring people together, really. We had uh, five people and myself that got together and, and we said, you know, instead of us speaking with separate voices about, yeah this is good open source intelligence. We brought it together on a single platform and decided, um, you know, this is what we want to do. And Technizet was one of those other people that was there at the very beginning. You know, the, the problem is when you're starting, it can seem overwhelming. So, you know, some people like to read, some like to watch videos. Do you have any like books that you could recommend any one of you? The <laughs> there, are, I'll say, I'll just say from, from my perspective, there are books out there about open source intelligence, but I think the minute that they are published, yeah. they are very much out of date, much like cybersecurity or many aspects of cybersecurity that are constantly evolving and changing. By the time you write a, a book about exploiting something, it's probably a little bit old. So 
in in open source intelligence, there are some books by several people. Um, but I think that watching social media, whatever platform you're on for the hashtags, watching, you know, going to some of these websites and, and YouTube videos, you absolutely will stay better informed and more up to date than following some of these books. But I don't know. Stephen, so, yeah, there's one book I will recommend, although you, you've made a really good point. The the material that's produced by the community um, can go out of date quite quickly because techniques change very often. Um, so it's hard to recommend a book I read this year or two years ago. That's still that's still relevant now. But I will mention one called Hack the World with OSINT by Chris Kubeka. For anyone who wants to think about offensive security, recon, it's a fantastic primer. Some, some of the things that she discovers in that book, like some of the insecure systems and vulnerabilities she finds just using open source intelligence. It, it's uh, fantastic if anyone who wants to get stuck into that. That's great. Technos, any, any recommendations from you? I must say I agree with Stephen as well. I like Chris's book a lot because it brought me more OSINT on a perspective which is not part of my daily job as much as it is for other people. I do have a copy of Michael Bazell's book as well, the Intel Techniques book. I do like it, but it's a very thick book and I'm not very well concentrated finishing thick books, <laughs> but it's a very good quality book when you are in the US because I've noticed that a lot of the things that he wrote are specifically for US only. So for me in Europe, it's not some of the things are not as relevant as they are to people in the States. When I look at like a lot of content online, it tends to be very US focused or very even European focused. But is it is the, is a lot of the resources on OSINT Curious relevant to like if I was living in Africa or in the Far East? Um, is it just general stuff that can be applied all over the place or um, are there specific skills for like the US versus other parts of the world? I think that a lot of things are pretty similar. Okay. So whenever I want to do an investigation on somebody uh, and I tend to use Google as my first search engine to go to, a lot of the search operators I use can be used in multiple parts of the world. Maybe I have to think about changing some language, maybe translating a specific name into Arabic or in Cyrillic or whatever. But there will always be specific websites only locally to a specific area. Yeah. So, for example, before Facebook was the number one platform in the Netherlands, there was Hives.nl. I used to work there. It looked like Facebook, had the same look and feel, but it was focused on Dutch people only. So if somebody from the States would be investigating somebody from the Netherlands, that should have been a, pro a, a platform they should visit and see if they can find any information. So there are always locally known websites that are quite popular um, and you need to catch up on that either by Googling or, for example, looking at the top visited websites of a specific country to see if there might be any websites in that list you're unfamiliar with. Uh, or looking at mobile apps that are popular, for example, in India, they probably are not the same apps that are popular in the UK yeah. or in Spain. And you need to get those platforms as well. There's a lot of similarities, but there are some country-specific or region-specific websites and apps you should definitely uh, investigate if you're in that specific region. So anyone up for a demo? You can do something. So one of the, the main things that we find in the open source intelligence investigative world is that we have certain data that we start out with. So if it's an email address or whether it's a phone number or a domain, we take that and then our whole job is to find other places, mostly online, where that data has pivot points, where there's other data out there. For example, I'll start out with just john at example.com. Most people know about going to Google. With most people, they will get these results. And you can see there are, a, there are, only, there are almost uh, 12 million, 12 million, 12 billion results that have come back. So the next thing that we have to do is obviously narrow down Google's results. Maybe we're looking for John at example.com and we, we put it in quotes. So the quotes say John at example.com, that string itself has to appear in the results. And notice our results have come down to 132,000 results. So previously Google was chopping up the word John example and.com. And now it's saying, oh, 
John at example.com is in the results. So just by adding quotes, we have some good results. We can add other things too. If we're looking for other words, we can add keywords, we can remove keywords. For example, maybe I don't want anything with the word test in it. So I can use the dash symbol here or, or the, um, yeah, the hyphen to say, don't give me anything with the word test in it. I just took out another 30,000 results. And through this iterative process of creating keywords, searching them, using Google operators, and then refining your results using these Google operators, we can narrow Google and Yandex and DuckDuckGo and other results. But I mean, other people will, will tell you that Google is only one piece of the pie. For instance, let's just take johnexample.com and head over into the cybersecurity world of searching for breach data. Um, very common thing that we do is take an email address and see if it's been found in any breaches. Because if we can find that, then what we might be able to do is identify passwords and systems where the accounts of this person might be found. Have I been pwned, which is a site that you're probably familiar with, might be familiar with. We come over here and what we do is we paste in our john at example.com and we find, oh no, it's in 98 breaches and 33 pastes. Each time we're doing this, we're recording what we're doing. The most glamorous part about OSINT is documentation. And I say that with a big grain of salt. But what we're looking for is those pivot points. Here we have johnandexample.com, our target email address, and we see that it's on the 500 PIC system. All right, now I know that there may be an account over there that I might want to pursue or an animal jam or something. And each one of these bits of data has other things like in this breach, there's email addresses, passwords, and usernames. Whether it's it's an email address or we can start out with um, a site that I really like, which Technozet and Steven will attest to, um, what's my name dot app. Sometimes you don't start out with an email address or you start out with an email address of like webbreacher at Gmail. And you're like, wait, that webbreacher could be a username. Well, not only do we go through our process for email address searching, but we also might want to break that web reacher off and then search on like the what's my name dot app site. I'll search for something else, John Doe. All right. And this site takes one username. And when you choose the category that you want to search, it'll have your browser make over 370 requests to find other places where an account for that username exists. So here on Coder Wall, there's a, you can see the, the URLs down here, Reddit, there's a John Doe user account. Gab has a John Doe user account. Over here on the right-hand side, we have a nice little table that we can export to our notes. And now we have a huge number of other sites that we need to start investigating. And when we find those sites, we work through our process to harvest the avatars and the biographical information, the location data, and we continue to move, uh, gathering data, analyzing it, and pivoting. Just to add up to what Michael is saying is that we do need to check if all of these results are one and the same person, because there's a very high chance that somebody else on the world has the same username as well. So we need to visit all of these sites, pivot further on to see if everything matches, and then only you can conclude, well, John Doe indeed has over 72 other accounts on other platforms, which we can either connect to each other or connect to that one person we're pivoting on. Have you got any examples of how this has helped something like in a case or just in a business or something? Well, I had a very successful case when I just started out in law enforcement. When in law enforcement, you get a lot of extra information about what everything else is going on within the police force. For example, I don't wear a uniform. But the people who work on the streets and who take care of all of the emergency calls, they experience a whole different world from the things that I do. We have like a newsletter. You get, get sent to your email once a week, just updating you on whatever is happening in the region you work in. Yeah. And as I was working in Amsterdam, we got an alert from Interpol saying that this girl, she came from Australia, she suddenly left her, her house. She was only 21 and she left a note on a table to 
her parents saying, well, I fell in love with this Dutch guy. He bought me a plane ticket. I'm heading over there. Well, see you later. Wow. I won't be back for a while. So the parents got very anxious because they were afraid their daughter might be in the hands of a human trafficker yeah. because they've never heard of this guy. And they were also very conscious because her mental health wasn't very stable. And all they asked in a newsletter was, if you see this girl, just check if she's okay. Report it back to Interpol. And I was yeah. like, hey, this is interesting. This is a young girl. She's 21. She must be out there on social media. So I was searching on Facebook, found her Facebook profile, but it had very, well, the information did it add up. I saw that there were some posts she was indicating she was in uh, Belgium, then suddenly she was in the Netherlands, but the pictures didn't add up with the city she was in. So then I found her Instagram account and she had two photos there. One saying, well, this is the front view of my balcony. And this is the other view from the backside of the apartment building. As I was looking at that picture, I was like, this, this screams that it's in the Netherlands. Because like the, the way the houses were built, there was a bus line and there was a bus actually driving. And I recognized the logos of a bus line that goes in the Netherlands. It must not be very hard to figure out where she is. And by looking closely at the picture she posted, I was able to geolocate it back to the apartment building she was probably staying in. And because I'm in law enforcement, we have a little bit extra data, more of the closed sources. And I was able to search for the name of the person she said she went to, to see if anyone in that apartment building might be having the same name. And I found only one person with the same name. So I called up the local police, because it was in another district than where I was working in. And I was like, hey, have you seen this newsletter? I think she's in this location. Maybe you can do a welfare check. And they were like, oh, okay, well, this sounds very legit. Let's go there and see who opens up the door. And it was the girl. So within oh, wow. less than two hours, I was able to find her, found her. She was indeed very much in love with the boy. Um, and I'm not quite sure. I hope they're still happily ever after. <laughs> but he was very he he was very uh, shocked that the police were at his front door, and he apologized a trillion times. And uh, so everything was good. She was not in the hands of a trafficker. But I was really happy that I was able to give relief to parents who were on the other side of the world, and me just behind my computer, not even ever stepping a foot in the location where she was. So that was quite cool. Is that how, how you got interested in this? Or was that after a period of time you'd already been doing this for a while? I was, this was in the first six months I was in law enforcement. It just definitely like lit the fire even more. I was like, yeah, if I can do this, I'm going to stay here and do a lot of this other stuff that I can help people with. What did your colleagues think about that? I'm assuming some of the older colleagues perhaps didn't realize the power of this. Absolutely. And still a lot of people are especially afraid yeah i think it's it's like uh the first time a computer got introduced on the work floor people were like oh no a computer <laughs> i like my typewriter much more oh no and i think there are people who still have that feeling like oh i like my computer now but the internet is quite scary i do like google but that's about it so i think there'll always be like a generation gap between people um, willing to adapt to new modern techniques. But isn't this an opportunity for someone who's young? Because I mean, a lot of people who are young and up and coming, you know, I'm showing my age, but I mean, not all of us grew up with an iPhone in our hands. This is a great opportunity for someone who's tech savvy, is that right? Absolutely. The world you have to navigate to work in open source intelligence is, is very familiar to you already if you're a young person. So yeah. you know how social media platforms work, you know which platforms are popular, or which are not. You might understand a little bit about the technical side of the internet, but when I think of um, some of my older colleagues in law enforcement or, or people of, of my parents' generation, for example, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have a clue really how to get, get started in this world. But if you are a younger person now and you know how to, I don't know, make a podcast or post a video on TikTok, 
you are already at the beginning of being able to understand the environment that we can work in. And it might seem to you that it's just something you take for granted, but yeah. actually there are a lot of people who lack those skills and it, it's you're at a huge advantage now if you're a younger person wanting to get into housing. There just seems to be a lot of opportunities, is that right? So, I mean, there's a lot of kind of jobs available. Is that correct? It depends. And many of the jobs don't say you must know OSINT. They they use other words like recon or or they they just say, you know, you have to be able to do certain skills. The skills that, that open source intelligence investigators use are used by lots and lots of people. I had a conversation with a recruiter one time and I said, you look for people with certain skill sets in certain parts of the world, and so do I. What do you do? And she looked left and she looked right and she said, let me let me tell you, I can get a lot of trouble for telling you this, but we use Boolean queries. I'm like, what do you mean Boolean <laughs> queries? She goes, okay, you go to Google and then you type in penetration tester or security engineer. I said, oh, that's a Google dork. We've been doing that for 20 years. She goes, no, no, no. Boolean searches. So, you know, a lot of people that do OSINT don't realize they're actually doing OSINT. And what we're seeing now with the advent of like OSINT-jobs.com and other places, the word OSINT is now becoming more prevalent in job titles and, yeah. and also job uh, fields. But it's also there are a lot of opportunities for volunteer efforts to help decrease human trafficking, to help people that are uh, domestic violence victims. A lot of those nonprofits use the volunteer efforts of people that want to get into OSINT to help their victims. I mean, a lot of people have the like cool and sexy, like I want to be a, a hacker and I'm going to use OSINT for that. But that's just one small, tiny piece of the pie. Is that right? Yeah, 100%. OSINT is multidimensional and red teaming, recon is just one part of the OSINT landscape. There are journalists who use OSINT, most famously Bellingcat, but many other journalists. Obviously, there's law enforcement, uh, but fraud investigators, risk analysts. I've even seen um, Binance, the cryptocurrency firm, are now advertising for OSINT specialists because they realize people are starting to understand what this word means. Um, so yeah, if you if you're looking to work in this field, um, your, the opportunities are vast. Probably as long as I've been in this area, more than they ever have been. I think. You know, the the field of cyber is absolutely huge with yeah. red teaming and blue teaming and all of the other different policy and compliance and all. Same thing over in OSINT. You know, there there are people that we know of that are amazing at geolocating a photo. You show them a photo, they they look at the fauna in there, they look at the flora, they look at the plants and trees, and they're like, oh, this this palm tree only is found in the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea within this latitude and longitude. But those people might not be great at social media exploitation like Technizet is is good at, or there's people that are really good at domains and IPs and who is and DNS that that do other stuff. So the the saying that you want to get into OSINT is still just the first step into this huge area that you can further differentiate yourself into. I think the scariest thing for me is the more I talk to you and the more I read about this, the more I want to take myself offline. Can you give us like some examples, you know, like if I wanted to be private, do I have to go and live in a cave? The answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, no. The answer is partially yes. Probably partially. everyone you know has to live in that cage too. The flaw of trying to hide online lies in the hand of your friends and family yeah. because they will post that picture of the family reunion. They will post a picture of you having dinner with your friends in either your backyard or a restaurant. So even though you might be trying to stay all of the, off all of the platforms, it's the people who stand close to you who are your biggest risk, probably. Well, it's even worse than that, right? I mean, if we want to get really scary with facial recognition that's out there, I mean, David, you're walking through t the city just minding your own business, and yeah. there's some tourist there that takes a selfie of themselves, and you're in the background, and you just happen to look. Now, whatever platform they are posting, they ha have a shadow profile for a person with your face. So even if you don't have your David profile on that platform, they know that a person with this face happened to be in that location on this date. And oh, look, they were over here on this other date. So there are a lot of privacy issues that are really, really important. The more private a person is, 
the less OSINT we can find online about them. And we do have to do things like what Technozet said, and we have to pivot to their family members, their colleagues that might be sharing their data. But yeah, there are absolutely ways that you can decrease your online persona to make yourself and your family more private. So let's talk about that for a second. Like Edward Snowden, like is it is like a famous example where the people love him or hate him. But he was like, um, he does this thing where he says you have to put something over your head when you look at your computer, or you have to do things to your phone and all kinds of crazy things. How would I become more private apart from living in a cave and having no friends and family? <laughs> that's really like well, you know, that's a solution. You just nailed it. Um, is is that the answer? Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Divorce my wife, have no kids, have no family, go live in a cave. One of the ways that people sometimes end up in OSINT, I think, when uh, they start to look at themselves. Yeah. But I think you have to figure out how private you want to be. So for some people, that is just increasing the settings on your social media profiles so that they're not publicly viewable. It might mean um, you don't have a LinkedIn profile, for example. It might mean if you register a website, you use a privacy service so that the who is is redacted, that kind of thing. Um, what, I, what I would suggest to people is know why you want to be private, first of all, because I think w- when I've sort of mentored or dealt with people who are new to OSINT sometimes, um, they really tie themselves in knots of anxiety about exactly well, what, what, if, what if Tor's compromised and what if yeah. my VPN provider, and do I have to have a, a VPN provider on a Raspberry Pi? I remember, I remember, I'll just give this as an, as an example of that. I was talking to a, a guy probably about a year ago. He was sort of 16, 17, starting out in OSINT, and he was going to take part in Trace Labs, which is a, an open source investigators capture the flag. It, it's to help find people who are missing in real life. It's a great cause. Um, and he messaged me saying, like, I'm about to do my first Trace Labs. Like, I've got one Raspberry Pi that's running my VPN, and that's connected to another Raspberry Pi, which is connected to Tor. And I bought this fan, fancy new router for my home setup, which has extra like open source firmware. And it was like, do you think that will be enough? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we're going to do OSINT, we're going to have this thing called privacy and we're going to do it properly. But you, you need to, it, to avoid tying yourself up in those knots and, and spending lots of time and effort. You need to think about why you want to be private first. What are you, at? do you just want to avoid being targeted by fraudsters? Do you just want to avoid corporations sleeping around your data? Or are you trying to take on like, the NSA? Because there's there's a big spectrum of um, things you can do to address those. Well, but- there's really two parts of that, right, Stephen? You, you mentioned, and David, you were talking about us as potential targets, yeah. making ourselves more private online. But then Stephen actually mentioned the operational security or OPSEC when you're doing open source intelligence investigations, making sure that you, me, Micah Hoffman, Stephen Harris, Technozet don't get caught up in the investigation. I don't know, David, if you've ever seen the the uh, Netflix show, Don't F With Cats. It no, was on, Go on. It, it, it's a, it's a three part series, I believe, about some people that found a person that was abusing a cat and eventually found out that this person was a, a murderer. He, he went and killed somebody. And wow. the, the challenge there was that these people who wanted to, who were doing open source intelligence investigations, they were not protecting themselves. And through a series of events, they created a Facebook group to talk about this and share things. And eventually the person that was their target joined that Facebook group. Oh. And it and it really opened each one of them up to becoming a potential victim. So as OSINT investigators, we do use VPNs. We do use virtual machines, which many people know about. Um, and we use those things, uh, things called sock puppet accounts, which are real accounts on social media that aren't in our own names to do our work. So when we're on Facebook, when I'm looking at things on Facebook, I'm not searching for people using Micah Hoffman on Facebook. I'm using a different account so that people can't attribute that information to me. But it really also depends on your personal risk that on your personal risk model. Who are you trying to protect yourself against? I mean, the problem is you can get really paranoid. I mean, Stephen, we live, both of us live in the UK. Um, and I mean, I'll say this in jest, but like the UK government has got this um, really, I don't know how to say it politely, this wonderful um, rule where they can spy on all your internet traffic. So some people who are very privacy focused might 
in jest say, you know, the UK is as bad as North Korea because they want to look at all your traffic. Is, is the answer, you, how paranoid do you want to be? I mean, if you really want to be out of it, don't live in London because you'll be on every camera on the underground because uh, England is like full of cameras. You know, what, what, what is like a reasonable ground to be fairly private? My experience is having been on the other side of that on, uh, on, some, on various law enforcement investigations, which using CCTV is a basic investigative technique. Uh, there are other more uh, secretive techniques to do with uh, communications and things like that. Having been in that world of it, I actually worry less okay. um, be, on the outside because seeing how it, it's not a data free for all. So if MI5 or the police want to access certain types of internet data about you, the bar for doing that is actually pretty high. Like you, you're talking about, you have to argue your case to a judge first. You can't just log onto the computer and say, oh, I'll, I'll see which websites David Bombal has been visiting this week. Like that, um, there are lots of safeguards in place, uh, and I actually worry less now than I might have done before. Um, in, all, in all honesty, but um, yeah, ha- can you hide from CCTV cameras? Um, yeah, come and move to the countryside. It's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd agree with that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, the reality is very, very difficult, and there has to be this. I think without going to the politics of it, we have to be um, vigilant about our freedom still um, and but be mindful that there are there are things there that do protect you to a certain degree in terms of how this material is all processed and accessed. Um, so yeah, so be, be proactive in monitoring how that changes. Best way that people can figure out how to make themselves more secure online is to figure out what's out there. Take 15 minutes or 30 minutes, Google yourself, Google every single one or use whatever search engine you want. Search every email that you have, put quotes around it, use every nickname, pseudonym, username that you've used and your family members and see what's out there. I can't tell you the number of times I've done an OSINT investigation in my my uh, the, my client says, hey, you know, we uh, I, I know I had these three accounts on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook or whatever. And and then I simply put in their phone number, email address or name sometimes. And it comes up with MySpace accounts or some comment that was left on a pornographic website using their username. And and it's embarrassing and it's simple to find. So in order to reduce your overall online perspective, go and find out what's out there. Make a note of it and go, hey, I think I should change my name on that website or or remove some of that data. Um, It'll really be helpful. And it's easy for anybody to do. So in other words, do an OSINT on yourself, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Because you also know what's right and wrong, right? If I search for Micah Hoffman, I'll be able to find results and go, wait, this is the Micah Hoffman out in California. That's not me. Um, And so I know what's out there. And then I can see, oh, wait, I didn't know that this was indexed. Um, One of the things that I think Technozek can absolutely attest to is that the social media platforms are constantly changing what's public and what's private in your accounts. Uh, I had a, an example one time, I, I did a, a security awareness training for a company. And I said, I'm going to look at myself, see what I can find for, for myself in 15 minutes, on myself in 15 minutes, set a timer, started doing things. And I was finding like all of my LinkedIn stuff that I know just a month before I had secured. And it turned out that LinkedIn did an update. And when they did the update, they changed some settings to make my profile more private. So my my data was hanging out there on the public Internet. And the only way I found that out was by actually doing the searches. My my sort of take is nothing you put on the Internet is secure, like uh, like on any social media website, should I say. So, I mean, be prepared that someone's going to fight it at some point. I suppose is sort of my paranoia way of looking at it. But that's interesting. So you do an OSIN on yourself and that will do multiple things. It'll help you secure your data and also teach you the process. Is is that kind of the idea? Yeah, absolutely. And as you start adding more and more tools, there's a a great website out there made by Bruno Mortier. OSINTframework.de is a site that has a huge amount of resources that with, with links. So Just start out doing what you know. If you only know how to Google, Bing, Yandex, Baidu, use a search engine, cool. But if you are competent on a social media platform, if you are somebody that understands some other things about domains and other stuff, then, you know, use some of the links that he has on that website or 
go to Technozet's website, type in the word phone in the search field, and you'll get a whole bunch of blog posts, YouTube videos, and websites that you can go to to search for your phone number to see if it's out there on any of the sites. That's great. Technozet, uh, there's a big problem in tech. There's too few women in tech. So is this an area for women or do you, you know, I'm assuming it is because you're in this field. The funny thing is that when I look at my fellow OSINT researchers in law enforcement, yeah. I would say the majority is female. Yeah. But not everybody is as fond of being in the spotlight. Like I'm publicly known. People know my face. People know yeah. I'm Technozet. Not everybody likes being in that kind of daylight. So I think there are quite some women out there which we are not familiar with or we, or we don't know them because they choose to stay in hiding. The whole discussion, if, if, if there are too little women out there in tech or in OSINT, I find it very difficult because it has to do a lot of with how you grow up. Because yeah. When I was a child, I used to play with Barbies, but my mom was the biggest computer freak I knew. So <laughs> she was actually teaching me how to do, like how to play a game on a, on a floppy disk using just the command line in Windows. And she actually taught me a lot of the things I still do today. But if you don't have that person in your life, that mom or your or dad or other people who have a um, educational role in your life, it can be a teacher on, on, a, on a school as well. If they don't offer you the opportunity to sniff whatever a computer can do, I think it can be really challenging. I think... A part of why women are maybe not so big in cybersecurity and computers, et cetera, is maybe because people tend to think that girls like other stuff. Yeah. So at a young age, they get a lot of other things than a computer in front of their uh, nose to play with. I mean, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but I think there's, if I look at my wife and myself, She's she would be a million times better at social engineering than me because she has this ability, uncanny ability to be able to sum up someone just by looking at them. And I'll I'll never see that. So do you do you I mean, I'll just use her as an example is is um, are there certain attributes that like ladies have that would a, would be a huge advantage in like OSINT? I mean, I think social engineering, my wife would be a million times better at that than I would. When looking at females in general, Maybe people think that there's a lower risk that we might be dangerous. So people tend to believe you a lot sooner probably than, let's say, a bold guy. Yeah. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> Why that, that hurts? <laughs> no offense. <laughs> no, offense. <laughs> no offense. At least he didn't say with a beard, you know, because that's, <laughs> a, that's, that's a, a one-two punch. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you guys have to leave the conversation now. <laughs> yeah, for, pretty much. You're absolutely right, David. I mean, the, the uh, social engineering uses a lot of OSINT to get that backstory, to get the bat, to to get the the data points to support the whatever trust type of ploy that you're going to do. And women not only have great in as a whole have a great investigative spirit, but they also are more believable actually carrying off those social media and those social engineering types of engagements if i would walk into a store and say oh can i please use the restroom there's a higher risk that or a higher chance that they will let me go in there sure then let's say a steven uh, <laughs> let's say steven <laughs> just because you can laugh and you can like smile a little and they will let you go but we're um a wolf in sheep's coats <laughs> And that's a good point, Technozet, that, I mean, we're talking about, well, you mentioned uh, being public versus being private. Um, a lot of people that do amazing open source intelligence work do not seek the limelight because of the sensitive targets that they're that they're working with. You know, when you're working at, with a organized crime or some kind of government that has some authoritarian types of of reins, or maybe you're you're investigating hit squads that have been sanctioned by government employees or by some government. 
Um, you are less likely to say, hi, I'm Micah Hoffman and I'm researching that country's hit squads publicly <laughs> because now the target's on me. So um, there are a lot of people that are not as public as we are with OSINT. Yeah, it's a very good point. Technoz, what advice would you give women then who are interested in this? Um, again, is it just like follow women on, on Twitter? Um, I just want to try and like broaden it. I, the reason I always do this is I've got two daughters. Um, and, you know, if I ever wanted to interest them in this tech, how would I convince them that this is cool and exciting rather than doing something else? If you have a daughter and you yourself are in the tech world in any kind of way or doing yeah. anything with computers or technical stuff, just to let them experience whatever you're doing a couple of times, let them help you do a small investigation saying you want to see whoever bought your grandmother's house after she passed away, for example. So That's a good just one, yeah. Google the address, show her some little tips and tricks that might be very helpful in her face of her life. So for example, if she needs to Google stuff to find resources to, for her study, help her saying, well, there are all of these Boolean searches or Google Torques you can use to find the exact literature that is helpful to continue your study with. Or if she's going on a date, let's Google this person together or I'll give you some tips so you can Google that person yourself just to check if he or she is a safe person to hang out with. And That's a good I one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that on any boy that likes my daughters. No. <laughs> Let me show you what daddy does when he researches yes. your boyfriend. That's always that's going to be great. Yeah. So just some some simple things that could make her life more convenient. That might spark a little bit of a fire on getting further into the field of OSINT. I hope. I think. I, I think it's great. I mean, it's like my daughter. Um, she's been on my YouTube videos from from young, and all she wants to do is be a hacker, and that's because she does it with me. And I, I think it's exactly right. You've got to, like your example of you, your mom teaching you computers. If you share your passion with your kids, uh, you know, they're going to also be inspired, hopefully, to, to get into this field. I did some work for uh, on on the in the dark web in yeah. Tor. And I remember when I was creating one of my talks, uh, my daughter uh, was a great age. And she decided that she wanted to come in and say, you know, what are you doing, dad? It's like, well, I'm on the dark web. You want to learn about the dark web? It was the safer areas of the dark web if those exist. But, you know, <laughs> I was showing her what what was going on. And and then at later at dinner, you know, my wife said, you know what? So what did you do today to my daughter? And she's like, oh, well, I saw how to buy drugs on on tour. And <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you want a fake ID or uh, want to buy a U.S. passport, this site has it. But if you want, I was like, OK, 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 we, we need to we need to dial that back a little bit. So but yeah, I mean, show them what's out there. And I think that also has the counter and the counter effect of if they see how easy it is for us to find those those Instagram posts and the TikTok. snaps that yeah. then they may be less likely to share publicly. How do you convince your kids not to post on TikTok and all these websites? Yeah. Show them how easy it is. You yeah. cannot prevent them from being online, but I think it's very important that you have the conversation in not a negative way. So not say you should unpost this and that on yeah. Instagram, or you shouldn't accept anybody as your friend but have an open conversation. I learned this a long time ago. There's an organization in the Netherlands very actively involved in teaching parents how to deal with their children and their online behavior. And one of the things one of the speakers said, well, just by asking your child, have you seen anything funny on Instagram today? Can you show me? Just to Get into that conversation, get into a, a very friendly field of just letting your child show you what they have been up to online, but not in a judgmental way. Yeah. So maybe you can laugh together about a funny video of a cat they maybe saw, and maybe you spot something that might be harmful or dangerous, then talk about it and say, hey, did you see that there's somebody commenting and swearing a lot? If you have any problem with this, or if you feel offended by this, please let me know, come to me and talk to me about this, because then we can 
handle things or, or help you further. So I think it's very important to have a conversation with your child about what they're doing online, but not in a judgmental and negative way. 100% agree with Lisette there. In my line of work, when I dealt with um, usually teenagers who had become victims of sexual abuse online, for example, um, the common theme there where things have started to go wrong with um, was that parents had no idea about what they're doing. And the advice we was used to give to parents is uh, to be proactive in your interest in what the kids are doing. So a, a lot of parents are technophobic. They don't know one platform from another. They just know they're in their room on the internet all day. But uh, And e even with um, youngsters who got into hacking and fell That's, foul of the A 15-year-old in, in Oxford, wasn't it, like recently? Yeah. yeah, and to be honest, this I was taught this statistic when I went in cybercrime. I don't know how true it is, but it was true in my experience that the average age is about 37, 38. For cybercrime, it's about 18 or 19. Wow. Like For kids who are getting into hacking, it's a perfect age where you have that curiosity, that drive, that want to prove yourself, to show off to your friends. Yep. But you're also not always the best at assessing risk and consequences at that age too. The, the younger you are, like parents, take please take an interest in what your kids are up to even if you don't understand it. Even if you don't understand it, that's probably the best reason to talk to your kids about yeah. it. Saying, hey, you're on Instagram all the time. Can you show me what it's like? Would it be something for me to be onto as well? And then say, of course, I will never follow you or like any of your pages because that will be very embarrassing to you. But show me, how does this work? One of the things that is was helpful, I think, in my family was my respecting of the kids and what they want and don't want posted. For instance, I, I know a lot of parents are taking pictures of themselves and their kids and just yeah. putting it on their social media. And I've heard people say, oh, my kids didn't want that to go online, but I just, you know, I'm the dad, so I'm gonna go ahead and post it. Yeah. And what we're teaching our kids is that they don't have a say in what their image, what images should be or should not be online. And so respecting that and teaching them also that, Taking pictures inside of your homes it can be dangerous. Uh, one of the things that Steven's really good at is doing image analysis and looking at the things that are in the background. I mean, David, I've been looking at that mindset is everything poster. I've been looking at all of those exactly. books and stuff. Yep. And we do that, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in some live stream or some picture and pulling out those details about how a family or how a person lives uh, can be extremely powerful in figuring out how to do trust games, how to social engineer them, or how to get them into um, some bad relationships. So teaching kids that when I look at somebody else's YouTube video and I can see, oh, look, he's got, he bought this thing. Let's research that product. Where did he buy it? And, or other things it helps them think about other people might do that to them as well. Yeah. So basically you're telling me to go live in a cave. Yeah. Uh, pretty much we're back to the cave yes absolutely <laughs> i mean that well, solves so many things unless your cave has wi-fi and in, in which case that that's that's a challenge too but yeah is there any closing thoughts or advice or any war stories i always love stories before we wrap it up I've, i have a good username story probably about four or five years ago now when i was still in law enforcement we were dealing with um a group of teenage hackers i call them hackers their actual hacking skills were quite were relatively low, but they were they were great at causing a nuisance online. So mm -hmm. they learned how to swap people, um, which is where you know you call in the law enforcement and tell them there's a gun at the house and get into trouble. Or they were sent emailing out uh, mass bomb threats to the, they got an email they got the email address of every school in the UK via via <laughs> via a freedom of information request and just ran a PHP script through every single email sending them, say, there's a bomb at the school, it's going to go off at 3.30 today, wow. blah, 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 um, and you need to evacuate. And that, that caused mass school evacuations in the UK. Um, their, their capabilities were limited, but in terms of the damage they could cause, um, yeah. it was quite significant. But they loved the attention. And rather than keep quiet, they sought, um, they sought approval from their peers. They wanted to taunt the FBI and they wanted to taunt the police. And so they took the Twitter and they set up Twitter accounts. And every day they would post these messages about what they'd been up to. And um, some of them were nonsense. Some of them were, they had actually done cause some harm to people. Uh, but their constant thing was, you'll never catch us. FBI, you'll never catch us. UK police, you'll never catch us. We're, we're undoxable e-gods and all, all this kind of stuff. 
So all we had to go on um, when I started looking at this were usernames. And they, what we figured out was that as part of, they saw it as part of their operational security uh, to continuously change their usernames. Um, I think in their mind, they thought, well, if I change my username all the time, I'll be harder to find. Yeah. But what we figured out, well, if they change their usernames all the time, they can't have always thought this. Like the ops, They're obviously fairly new to this. So if we can go back far enough to some of their other social media accounts, we'll find what their old usernames were, and we'll work with those. So there's a couple of things we can do with Google. For example, we can filter Google results by time. So if I wanted to search for what David Bombal was talking about in 2014, I could just set up a Google filter and just show yeah. me results in 2014. So we did that with their usernames. And we got went back only a couple of years when they were in their early teens, when they were into Minecraft, and they they had we had their Minecraft usernames. And we used tools um, like what's well, I, th- I don't think you'd release what's my name that app at that stage, Mike. This is about probably four or five years ago. We used some similar tools to find what, what other platforms. Uh, did they have these, did they use these usernames on? And this one guy who who's the leader of the group, we took his Minecraft username and we ran it through the platforms and we found he had an account on Reddit. So how do we know it was his? Well, he, he, he was mostly talk about Minecraft and things like that. So we, yeah. we inferred from the content, it's probably the same guy. But what we found in one of the posts he's made on Reddit was he had used what we call a, a PGP key to verify that the account was his. And um, for, for those of your, of your viewers who are not familiar with a PGP key, it's basically a it's a unique um, string that identifies you. It's, it's like a signet ring. It's like your autograph, a fingerprint. So when I tag my Reddit account with a PGP key, it's definitely mine. And then we, we so we can then search through his PGP key, which we could link to an email address. And then we took the u- email address and we did a search on the first part of that. We took the first part of the email address, like Mike has showed before, and eventually it came to be found an account on Pastebin. Uh, Pastebin, um, it doesn't seem as popular as it used to be, but um, Pastebin was what well, is basically a site where anyone could dump any old random text uh, and share it with anybody. So it used to be used for data breaches and things like that. Yeah. Um, but we found he had had some technical issues with the DDoS tool that he was making. He was as, as part of their campaign of terror. They were doing DDoS for hire or DDoS as a ransom. So they would dock a company's website offline and say, unless you pay us so many thousand dollars, you're not going to get any customers. It, it, again, it was fairly low level stuff, but quite disruptive for, for yep. the victims, for sure. And in one of these pastes, we found a conversation they'd had between both of them where they were trying to use a VPN, but they couldn't get it to work. They were trying to run a VPN connection to their DDoS tool, and they couldn't get it to work. So they pasted to try and troubleshoot it they pasted the log into pastebin i went through this and it also had the username it had the home ip address that they were trying to connect to in the logs it had the log of the server that they were trying to the ip address of the server they were trying to connect to so immediately we can link username to home ip to the ddos tool and it had the mac address of the device that he was connecting from in there and again if your viewers aren't aware the mac address is the unique serial number on the network adapter on your laptop. And yeah. so it, and they're one of a kind, they're unique, they're like fingerprints. So lo and behold, when uh, my colleagues in the, in I think it was Hertfordshire police, uh, when they went down to arrest him, they went to his house and sure enough, when they seized his laptop, it was the same Mac address. So it was, I mean, he, he, cho- he, cho- he was arrested, remanded in custody and he chose to be gu- plead guilty after that. Um, but that was all from a username, that from people opening their mouths on Twitter, You'll never catch me. You should know if you do that, that is a red rag yeah. to a police officer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you say FBI, you'll never catch me. Well, you know what's going to happen. Um, and he was a teenager when he was when he was. Yeah, he was 17 or 18 at the time, being his early 20s now. But yeah, he, he went to jail for three years um, on the back of that. And his counterpart in the US went to jail for eight years. I think the Americans are more, more generous with their sentences, perhaps. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but the yes, yeah, so, but that started from uh, username inquiries username and pivot and pivot and find a key find an email turn that into a username pivot again and you, you find this stuff and there were a lot of rabbit holes along the way and it took several weeks to do this it wasn't instant um so that's that's my favorite username story i don't know if i'll ever top it back when i was working for a, a company years ago 
Uh, one of the the the, re, the use cases for OSINT that we had was finding missing employees. We had yeah. a lot of employees, and sometimes one or two of them didn't show up to work, and we'd have to call them and email them and try to find them. And um, I remember one time this person just didn't reply to their emails, didn't reply to their phone. Um, we tried next of kin. Nobody had any idea where this person was. And so naturally we start thinking this is a case of uh, of probably safety, of public safety. Uh, we don't know where this person is. We hope that they're okay. And so what we started doing was taking those uh, those selectors, those phone numbers, emails, usernames, and then looking at social media. And we didn't find anything. Um, we knew that they took off on a flight from one place and they were supposed to go see a client for work and they never made it. And so after exhausting all the social media platforms, looking at all of the other places, uh, we decided to branch out and widen the area and start looking at news events that had happened. And we took the flight number, the destination, yeah. and this person, not even this person's name, but just those things. And we just started searching. We found on a news site that there was a medical emergency that had happened while the airplane that he, this person was flying on was en route to his destination. And the, it said that, you know, the person, the patient, whatever, was taken immediately to this hospital for further evaluation or emergency surgery. And it turned out he had an appendicitis attack at wow. 35,000 feet. And the only way we knew about this and knew where he was, was from some public events that were shared. I've joked multiple times now about going and living in a cave, but I mean, the world is so connected these days. It's, um, I suppose the advice, or what, what advice would be, be be careful with what you share online. Uh, be careful with your personal data. Is, is that is that kind of the bottom line? That, that's Probably a start. Google yourself. Google yourself is better because one of the things that you'll find is that some of the stuff out there, David, is not a not stuff that you've posted or maybe even your family, but it's stuff that I, mean, I don't know if you're a runner or a bicyclist and you you compete in races. Uh, I'm, I'm an IT guy. I don't I don't I don't I don't exercise. No, I'm yeah, kidding. me Go. neither. Me neither. I gave it up for privacy reasons. We well, yeah, when you finish your race or whatever, they put your name, your age. And and other thing, your time online for other people to get, and I don't want people to get that. But I was doing a case one time, and I was looking, and the my target was a runner, and I noticed that on every finishing, you know, like race results list, there was a woman with his same name that finished just a second or two faster, and she was eight years old. And I was like, well, okay, same last name, runs every single race that he does. Eight years old, this is probably his child. And sure enough, you know, just by looking at those running races, which were public data, it was easy to identify that. So using the Google technique will help find those things too. Weren't the Americans in Iraq or somewhere and they were running and their Fitbits You're were talking about Strava. Track. Strava is an exercise application, been around for a while. And uh, it allows people to use their smartwatches and Fitbits to track where they go using GPS. And then they upload that data to a website. It's a social website so that they can share that data and say, hey, Technozet, look, I ran over here. And the problem, one of the biggest problems that has come to bear with that is that Many places where service people from around the world were actually running were on bases that yeah. may not have been in public satellite imagery. So in 2018, when Strava aggregated a whole bunch of those runs, those bicycle, bicycle rides, those walks that people had generated and they created and they essentially updated this heat map. And you can go to the Strava heat map now online and you can look at an area and the brighter a path or road is, the more activity has happened there. The idea there is that, you know, if, if a person in a certain country or city is in charge of maintaining trails, they can just look at the Strava map and say, oh, this is very bright. This trail is heavily used. The problem became is when people made that map uh, have a dark background and then they moved over places where there were no roads and they saw very bright areas like in the middle of the deserts in different places in the Middle East. They would look in those deserts and say, hey, there's a very bright spot there. And when you look at the Google satellite imagery, there's nothing there but desert. 
And yet, if you look at the Strava data, you can see that people were absolutely running yeah. on a, a very, very structured road layout. And Strava, to their credit, once people said, hey, you're revealing where our bases are, uh, Strava removed some of that data. Um, but yeah, I gave a talk back in 2015 about that, where people over there in the UK were making their, well, a company over there in the UK was making their guards use Strava as they walked their patrols around different facilities. And then their guards would log in, patrol Stephen and Technozet at 0425, and they put that out uh, publicly. And I looked at the Tilbury Power Substation over there, and you could see the exact path aggregated over time in this heat map of where the guards were walking and where they weren't walking as well. And it was it's incredible. If someone wanted to do something nasty, that would show them where to where to attack, basically. Is that what you say? Yeah, absolutely. In this exact case, uh, the guards would walk along the west, south, and east sides of this Tilbury Power substation. The whole northern uh, side was never, ever walked on, at least never walked on while the person was logging things to Strava. It absolutely can be used for reconnaissance and, and uh, physical. It is, however, so. far less than it used to be because the functionality for other people to see where you were, so to actually see the tracks they were running onto, uh, this feature was called flyby. So yeah. you would be able to upload a route and to see whoever flew by the, the location you were running, walking or cycling on. And Strava actually turned this off by default. So if you want to share publicly what your exercise route is, you have to manually um, switch it on again. So the amount of data that was found a couple of years back, it's probably not the same as it is today. So that's for everybody who's now very anxious watching this YouTube video, <laughs> like, oh my God, my Strava data is out there. If you have never switched this on, this is still off. So, but maybe check your Strava privacy settings just to be sure. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're, not, you're not making me any more confident because like I'm talking to the three of you and the more I listen to the three of you, the more anxious I get about like, okay, I'm going to go live in that cave. Hopefully have inspired people watching to go and Google themselves and also get into this field because it's a, it's a very much a growing industry, isn't it? There's a lot of demand. Is that right? Google yourself. And if you want to show your employer the benefit of OSINT, Google your company yeah. and find you'll find lots of security and other skeletons in the closet um, that you wouldn't find otherwise. Yeah. Google yourself and Google your employer. <laughs> well, thanks so much. I really want to thank the three of you for, you know, spending so much time with me. Hopefully I can convince you to come back and, you know, perhaps get into more techie stuff like get into the weeds. We've done a little bit about that. But for the audience, any of you watching, please put your questions below. Um, that I can ask in another video um, or we can answer in the comments below. Really want to thank you for spending so much time with me. Thanks. The more you learn about open source intelligence, the less likely you are to publish, to post, to social media. Um, it's just scary what's out there. I hope you recorded that. Nope, I didn't. Well, it's good. I recorded it in Zoom, so that's... No! <laughs> I'm kidding. If you don't want me to post that, I won't.